Welcome to the Science of Success with your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success. I'm your host, Matt Bodner. I'm an entrepreneur and investor in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm obsessed with the mindset of success and the psychology of performance. I've read hundreds of books, conducted countless hours of research and study, and I'm going to take you on a journey into the human mind and what makes peak performers tick. With a focus on always having our discussions rooted in psychological research and scientific fact, not opinion. In this episode, we discuss why you can't outthink your emotions, the relationship between trauma and our mind body connection, how to start listening to your emotions, the power of hypnosis, and how to drop into your body to experience what you're truly feeling with Renee Brent. The Science of Success continues to grow with more than 800,000 downloads, listeners in over 100 countries, hitting number one new and noteworthy, and more. I get listener comments and emails all the time asking me, Matt, how do you organize and remember all this incredible information? A lot of our listeners are curious about how I keep track of all the incredible knowledge I get from reading hundreds of books, interviewing amazing experts, listening to awesome podcasts, and more. Because of that, we've created an epic resource just for you, a detailed guide called How to Organize and Remember Everything. And you can get it completely for free by texting the word SMARTER to the number 44222. Again, it's a guide we created called How to Organize and Remember Everything. All you have to do to get it is to text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Or go to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and put in your email. In our previous episode, We discussed what to do if you feel like you're having a midlife crisis every two years, the importance of staying grounded while you make big changes in your life, how to pivot your career and take smart risks, how to discover your strengths, and the right way to make big, exciting changes in your career with Jenny Blake. If you're thinking about changing your career or making a pivot, listen to that episode. Today, we have another exciting guest on the show, Renee Brent. Renee is a certified clinical and transpersonal hypnotherapist. She's the director and instructor of the externship program at the Orlando, Florida Institute of Hypnotherapy. She's also the best-selling author of How Big Is Your Butt? Discover How to Let Go of Blocks and Move Forward in Your Life. Renee, welcome to the Science of Success. Thank you, Matt. I'm happy to be here. Great day. Well, we're very excited to have you on. So for listeners who may not be familiar with you and some of your work, tell us a little bit about yourself and share your story. Certainly. I am been a registered nurse for over 25 years. And I used to think in nursing that the body controlled the mind, how we felt physically affected the mind. And I started to see in nursing and in the trauma room, I was a trauma nurse, that if I could connect with somebody and help them have that human connection with me at the front of the bed, if they just had a car accident, motorcycle accident, whatever, if I could do that, then they felt better, the vital signs were better, and they were more connected. So that intrigued me. And then I got divorced, and I wanted a new career and had some experience with healing and hypnotherapy. And off I went, never looked back. It was the best decision because now I understand truly that the mind, our thoughts, control the chemistry and our reaction to us physically. And that is very intriguing for me as a clinical hypnotherapist to help people with the mind-body connection. So what is the difference between a a hypnotist and a hypnotherapist? Good question. So a hypnotist usually has about 50 to 100 hours of training. Someone who can do hypnosis can put someone into the state of hypnosis, which is not that difficult. It's really a change in a brainwave. A hypnotherapist is someone who can put someone in the state of hypnosis, but actually allow them to get to their truth. And a hypnotherapist, I do not tell people how to feel or think. Everyone, every single person has what they need within them, but they're blocked by a conscious reality sometimes. So to be able to get into the state of hypnosis and allow someone to awareness of their truth, then they can start releasing blocks. You have to be aware of blocks and false beliefs in order to change them. And hypnosis is a beautiful way to bypass the conscious mind, get to the boss, which is the subconscious mind, and make those changes. So I just give people the opportunity and also within protocol to help them kind of guide them loosely to healing and a place of forgiveness and understanding acceptance and really change how they perceive life at the end of some sessions. It's pretty remarkable. 
So tell me a little bit more about hypnosis itself. How does it work and how does it bypass the, the sort of conscious watchdog and get to the root of many of these subconscious issues? Yes. Hypnosis, like I said, is just a change in a brainwave. And I really approach this from this platform of science. That's why I'm so excited to be on your on your show, Matt, because this is my world, is the science of the mind and what's going on. And hypnosis is not woo-woo. What I do is not obscure. It's based in science and brainwaves and our perceptions of a child and how we access information. So I put someone into the state of hypnosis. It's not that difficult. We go in and out of hypnosis all day long. We're in a beta wavelength, which is human, which is survival. That's 5%. That's conscious mind. 95% is a subconscious mind. And the way to access that is dropping into an alpha wave. And we do that when we're driving in a car, when we're in a shower, we're just hypnotized by the, the sounds of the waves on a beach when we're really connected to that. That is hypnosis. And it's not that hard to get into. And that's what I help people do. And there, that's when we're really, people think hypnosis puts you to sleep, Matt, but it really wakes, it wakes you up. Your, your truth, that aha moment is life-changing for people. And I really, you know, I tell people I have the best job in the world because I get a front row seat. I get to help people explore their truth and change it and change the reality and release those, you know, my book, How Big Is Your Butt, those big butts that block them and they're not even aware of them. So really crucial to change is getting into the to the subconscious mind in an altered brainwave. That's really fascinating. The idea that we dip in and out of hypnosis in sort of our day-to-day experience is something I never really thought of. You mentioned driving as an example. Another one that that I think is really relevant for me personally is I love to play video games. And sometimes I feel yep. like I can be playing a game and it's almost like I blacked out for like 20 minutes and I'll be like, what just happened? So Exactly. I've been when it's hit- when it's four in the morning and you don't know, you don't know where the rest of the day went and you haven't eaten for you know 10 hours because you've been playing this game. You have absolutely been hypnotized when you have an altered in time lapse. My clients, I'll do in a session for an hour and a half, and they really could swear that they were in for 15, 20 minutes. So that's a good indication of of hypnosis, absolutely. Is there a relationship at all between hypnosis and and flow states? And and I think of that because in many ways, you know, I've always felt like when you kind of have that that sensation that time has, has passed by and you didn't really understand it, in many ways, that's connected with the idea of flow. Yes. You know, really when you're living in your passion and you're living in your flow, then you're living in your heart. You're living in your truth, which is the subconscious mind. So you can naturally go into that. I mean, I've never worked harder in my life, but I am so passionate. That's why I tell people, if you're living in your passion, but you have days where you're struggling, where you're like, oh my God, why am I doing this? What's going on? I can't do anything. Hold on to the why you started it in the first place. If you're in school or a new career, hold on to the why, the end game, because that'll keep you in your flow. That'll keep you in your subconscious state and keep you out of that conscious, a conscious mind that's so analytical. It's so judgmental. So you're absolutely right. Being in your flow is being in a, in a relaxed living from the heart, actually. I'd love to dig into that that concept, this sort of dichotomy between the the analytical mind and how emotions are often kind of stored in our body and how we can get really caught up in, you know, thought patterns that prevent us from truly experiencing our emotions. I know that's something you've you've done a ton of work on. Tell me a little bit about that that whole concept. That's basically the work that I do with my clients. Our subconscious mind, 95%, the boss, when you want to go to, you want to get something done, you go to the boss, right? So it makes sense to drop into the state and do the work, but it holds our emotions, our beliefs, our memories. It holds all of that. And it's always trying to talk to us, Matt. The subconscious mind's job is to move us away from pain and towards pleasure. It wants us to heal. It has a lot of jobs and it's always trying to communicate and it comes up and we're not taught how to manage the subconscious mind, by the way. And that's a real problem for people because it comes up and we push it down with the, nope, I got to do this. I got to get this job done. I got to take this test. I got to do these things. And you're like, no, and you push it down and you push it down. If you spend a lifetime of not having awareness of the subconscious mind or not listening to it, it will show up to you because it starts as a whisper and then it starts louder and louder and it's screaming at you. And it could be screaming at you in lots of ways, which is maladaptive behaviors, addiction, weight gain, 
overuse of drugs and alcohol, porn, all of these things, it'll show up and it's trying to get you to listen. And I tell people when they walk in my office, you know what? I want you to thank that behavior. I want you to thank that 50 pound weight gain because it got you in the office when you're stuck and you don't know why it's your subconscious mind is just dug its heels down and said, no, you are going to listen to me now. And I love it when young people in their twenties come to see me because if you could learn this in teens and 20, I also see children who have a lot of anxiety, but if I can get someone between the ages of 18 and 30 and they can change their patterns and start listening to the subconscious mind, then you've created a lifetime of ease. But the majority of my clients are in their 50s when they've had three marriages, they've had addiction, they've had health problems. So I love teaching people this early and it's crucial to pay attention and just learn. It's not that difficult to learn the skills to do it. And that's one of the reasons why I do what I do, why I speak publicly, why I wrote the book, because I want to teach people mainstream. It doesn't have to be woo-woo. Mainstream how to learn some techniques to just listen through the day and you'll sleep better, you'll eat better. You know, it's pretty incredible how life shifts when you do that. I think it's fascinating, and, and I've, I've definitely experienced this in my own life, that if you consciously try to sort of suppress or avoid your emotions and your subconscious, it will bubble up. It will kind of manifest itself in all kinds of different ways. I think it's so important to really understand and kind of start the journey because it's, it's not sort of a, a one-second you know, awareness, but really begin the journey of understanding of how listening to your emotions and experiencing them can help you much more effectively deal with those kind of maladaptive behaviors that you talked about. And they're not going away. And you can have a life, for instance, for me, I had some extreme false beliefs from my childhood and I found a way to move through them, push them aside and have outsourced things that help me feel better. I was married for 20 years. I had three children. I was busy volunteering and working as a nurse. Kept very busy on the external, but I wasn't listening to the internal. And then I got divorced from a 20-year marriage, and all that was ripped away. It really unsettled me, and I was forced to look at it. So I know what it's like to push it down and be happy. But when you close your heart, you don't cry all your tears, but you don't laugh all your laughter. And only true joy exists, Matt, when you can start paying attention to your subconscious mind. And you don't have to be in your emotions all the time. Nobody is. There's three things you can do with emotions. You can shove them down and they're going to show up in your body or your life somewhere. The second one is you can scream or cry or road rage is about this. It's never about what it's about. It'll show up. Nobody gets out and shoots somebody because they pull down in front of them or they were going five miles beneath the speed limit. It's about something else. The third one is you can learn to allow. And I teach people every day to open your heart and learn to allow without being caught up in the emotions. And that is the key to success. You cannot overthink or outthink this stuff. Positive thinking doesn't work when you're in a survival state. The only thing you can do is survive as a human. And your body doesn't know the difference between you're running from a lion or you have a job that you hate or you're overwhelmed with you know, home life. You must drop into an altered state to be able to really shift that for yourself. So many. I said a lot. I said a no, lot there. Yeah, so you did. Go where you want with it. There's so many good points, and I, and I want to dig into a couple of them. <laughs> you know, one of the ones that that I think is really important, I and mean, we actually talked about this on a recent episode, is the idea that the example you use with road rage. You know, it's it's never about that particular moment of anger or or rage or unhappiness. It's much more about this kind of deep seated emotional environment that causes that to happen to begin with. And I think that's such a critical point that that so many people miss. And there's two sort of things that that makes me think of. One is the idea that everybody's kind of fighting a battle that you know nothing about and that whole quote and that concept that helps sort of cultivate compassion. And the other is that when people are sort of rude to you or mean to you, in many instances, it's often not a reflection of you in any way. It's often just a reflection of kind of their internal emotional situation spilling out into their experiences and events in their daily lives. Absolutely. And this is absolutely the result of false beliefs. And when we're younger than 10 years old, Matt, our subconscious and conscious mind is open. And anything that's said or done to us can be encoded as truth. And it doesn't have to be drama or trauma. It could be as simple as 
a teacher who laughed at you when you got up and misspelled a word or did a thing on the board. It could be in third. I had a woman who was had a beautiful life and by anyone's standards, but she woke up every morning unhappy and sad and she didn't understand it. She came to see me and we regressed to the first time she felt these things in hypnosis. And she went to third grade and she was standing outside of a room with her best friends. And they decided that day that she was not good enough to be in their group. And they made fun of her encoded stamped into her in that moment was that she's not good enough, that she's not a part of, she carried that pattern for the rest of her life, but didn't have an awareness of it. So false beliefs, we filter our perception of the world through that every day. If you have a belief that you're not good enough, that you're ugly, or that you're not lovable, anything that someone says to it, a boss, a partner, a friend, someone in a grocery store, if they say something to you, it's going through that filter and it's changing what you're hearing. So if a boss says to you, you know what, I really want you to look at this number. I really want you to just take another look at that, what you handed in to me. If you feel like you're not good enough or stupid, it's filtering through that and you're hearing a completely different message. My boss hates me. They think that I'm stupid, but that's not what the boss was saying. So it changes and it causes this turmoil within us without us even knowing it. So it's very important to understand those false beliefs and the perception and pay attention to what we're hearing. I do work with couples and I tell them, if someone's reacting to you, it doesn't make sense with what you thought you were saying. You're married, right, Matt? I am. Yeah. So you understand this. You could say something to your wife and she has a completely different reaction than what you expected. Absolutely. I want you to ask her, what did you hear me say? This is communication is not what you say. It's what the person hears. This is true communication. So ask her, what did you hear me say? And she may be hearing something completely different. That's when you start talking about it, when you clarify what you meant, because everyone is doing this every day with anything that is said or done to them. I love that question. What did you hear me say? It's, it's a great way to kind of pierce through the, the filter and see what, you know, kind of came out the other side and how someone interpreted your actions. But before, yeah, absolutely. before yeah. we dig into kind of filters and false beliefs and limiting beliefs, which I want to go into, I want to zoom back out or kind of talk about something we talked about a little earlier, which is how do we kind of cultivate the ability to listen more effectively to our subconscious mind? Certainly. So learning some techniques to push a pause button if you're feeling overwhelmed, anxious, fearful, you know, angry. Just be able to push a pause button because pushing a pause button pattern interrupts in the brain allows you to just stop for a minute and then regroup. And when you regroup, you can get in touch with what was really going on with you. Then you can have the truth talk. What's really going on with me? Is that the truth? And then you can start those. So in my book, each chapter I have, each one builds on the other where I have techniques where you could start listening to the subconscious mind pretty effectively. And you cannot heal it till you bring it up from the subconscious mind. So for instance, if someone is feeling completely overwhelmed, what they can do is breathing. I know breathing is so, I don't know, popular or, or it's a tagline, but it's really important. And I teach people why to breathe. When we're feeling uncomfortable or we're feeling fearful or anxious, anxiety, by the way, is just a symptom of fear. And it's the chemistry of, of the body that's anxiety. It's not an emotion. When you're feeling that in your body, the physical symptoms, because every emotion has a physical reaction, when you're feeling that, we tend to breathe shallow. It's part of the fight, flight, or freeze. We freeze. We think that if we breathe shallow and we just stay put for a minute, that things are going to go away, and they're not. We're just going to get hit by it harder. So if you're breathing shallow through the day, I want to encourage people to take a big breath in really breathe in and then exhale. And when you do that, you're actually holding it for a few seconds. You're pressing slightly on a vagus nerve right at the diaphragm. And when you do that, you allow this beautiful surge of chemicals and your parasympathetic nervous system to kind of come and check and balance. So you can shift things pretty quickly by taking a few breaths when you're feeling that way. And that's a good step to pattern interrupting. And on the concept of, of learning to allow, how do we kind of cultivate that as a reaction as opposed to either ignoring, kind of shoving our emotions down or just letting them simmer into anger or crying or whatever it might be? 
So we're all allowing one way or the other, and we're not allowing by using, you know, alcohol, drugs, you know, whatever to suppress. To learn to allow is dropping into an altered state of hypnosis into an alpha wave, which could be deep breathing, doing a countdown, getting some meditation that you like. I have two free ones on my website or Headspace is a great thing to do and get in the habit of taking about five, 10 minutes a day to just drop into the state and say, what's going on with me right now? Not allowing it to amplify. So if you're feeling angry, take those breaths and drop in to say, what's really going on with me? I teach techniques like tapping. I don't know if you've heard of EFT or tapping. It's a good way for people to just start understanding. I do meditations like opening the heart or teach people to drop in and connect to higher perspective. But the real change to listening is teaching yourself quickly how to drop into an alpha wave. And it's not hard to do. Breathing, countdowning, you know, learn how to do self-hypnosis. All hypnosis is self-hypnosis. But when you're feeling something, you're saying, man, I'm really angry right now. Just acknowledge it. Don't try to push it down. Don't blame it on someone. Take accountability for it. Right now, I am feeling angry. Man, that really hurt my feelings. I'm feeling very sad. When we learn to allow and acknowledge emotions, they begin to release. They amplify when we push them down. They release when we allow. So just by saying, what's going on with me right now? Oh, I'm feeling sad. Just that will make people feel better. People feel better just in 20 minutes of talking to me on the couch because I don't tell them how to feel. I just give them an opportunity to express how they feel. So just acknowledging it and then saying, okay, I'm feeling angry. I'm ready to release it. What's really going on with me? And then, you know, dropping into an altered state. Was that clear enough for you? No, that's great. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think those are some really valuable tactics to kind of drop into your body a little bit. You know, personally, I'm very kind of cerebral person. And and one of the things I've been working a lot on is trying to cultivate that body awareness. So this is something I'm really fascinated with. Sure. So let me tell you about body awareness. And not everybody has emotional words. Not everyone wants to acknowledge that they're sad or afraid or angry. Some people just aren't, don't have that ability to acknowledge that I have people that can't give me emotional words. But what you always have, always, is your physical body. Your physical body is your emotional GPS. And emotions show up because you have an emotion, you have a chemical response, and it reacts in the body. And then you have a reaction in the body, and then it validates the thought. And then you're in a mind melt merry-go-round. You know when you're angry and one little, this happens in couples sometimes, when you're angry, Then you have a chemical response and your body starts to tense up. And then you think of other things that made you angry. And then you're like, and yeah, you did that. And then you go round and round and round. And before you know it, you're completely off topic and you're rageful. It's because of the chemical response to it. When we're feeling emotion, there's something called the felt sense, feeling the sensation of emotion, energy in motion. It shows up usually somewhere between your chin and your lower abdomen and When you're angry or upset or anxious or fearful, Matt, where do you feel it in your body? You know, that's something I've been thinking about. And after reading your material and and watching a couple interviews, I started to kind of develop some awareness of that. I think typically it's it's kind of almost like right below my rib cage is where I I, I think I typically feel it. Sometimes in my lower back, maybe. Okay. It's something that I, as I said, I'm still trying to understand and kind of cultivate this ability So it's something I'm really curious about and want to learn more about. Sure. And I teach people when you drop into that sensation, you're actually dropping into the subconscious mind because now you're allowing. So if you're feeling this in your lower rib cage, you just, what you do is you take the breaths and then you put your hand right where you feel it, drop into the sensation of it. Don't judge it. Just drop into it and say, if there was an emotion attached to this, what would it be? It might be fear. It might be anger, whatever. I don't question it, but you'll hear the word. The subconscious mind, right, is excited because you're listening to it. You're dropping into the sensation. So you're going to feel better already. So when you drop into that sensation right there and just say, oh, this feels like fear. Okay, so what's going on with me? And then when you breathe, you'll start hearing, I'm afraid I'm going to fail or I'm afraid that I'm not going to be loved or I'm afraid they're going to leave me. You will hear those things. And then that's when you start arguing for your truth. 
The truth is that I am smart and I can do this. The truth is I am lovable. I am capable. I can create this life that I want. But you have to drop in and understand what's going on for you. If you do not have a word that shows up for you, there's something you can do that I teach in the book called Release to Peace. Christian Michelson created this and I've adapted it for myself. I love it because it's a way to allow without acknowledging what's actually going on with you. So if you have that feeling in your rib cage or your lower back, Matt, I want you to just put your hand on it. If no word comes up, you have no emotional word for it. That's okay. Send that emotion, that feeling, that sensation. I know this sounds really corny, especially for your audience, but it works. Send it acceptance and love. Just that's all you do. No judgment about what it is, why you don't have a word for it, anything. Just send it acceptance and love and it will release. Often it shifts. I tell people to follow it and it'll go from their stomach to their heart or to their neck and then it'll let go. It will release because what you're doing is allowing. It's a backdoor way to allow emotion through the sensation because the sensation is your emotional GPS in the subconscious mind. I love that. I think it's amazing. And I'm definitely going to practice all of these exercises next time I, you know, I feel something or kind of feel a little bit off. I can't wait to put in some of these ideas into practice. Yeah. If people do that through the day, when you feel it coming up and not shoving, it just, it doesn't take long, 30 seconds, and I can help someone release it. You can learn that. Absolutely. Everyone who's listening can release that. When you do that through the day, then the evenings are going to be better for you. You're going to eat better. You're going to take better care of your body. You're going to sleep better, absolutely sleep better. And then you're going to create this pattern of acknowledgement, but also peace. The mind is a reflection of the heart, Matt. If the heart is quiet and you pay attention to it, the mind will be still and you will be able to focus and reach your goals and create the success that you want. So I'd love to dig into kind of the relationship between, and this is getting into more kind of the idea of these false beliefs and the filters that we have that explain or that we use to interpret reality. I'd love to get into the relationship between beliefs and emotions and external events and how those are Mm -hmm. all kind of connected and how we form these filters that shape our understandings of reality. Absolutely. And this is the basis of the work. I'm an instructor, like you said, of hypnotherapy. So I teach this to my my students through the school, there's a pattern. So it's events and emotions, really it's relationships because it's not just one event, it's a relationship. So it's events or relationship that usually happen younger than 10 that occur that create beliefs. Beliefs create emotions and emotions create symptoms. And it doesn't matter how old you are. So let me say that again, events or relationships younger than 10, like I said, it doesn't have to be drama or trauma. I have people that say, but I had an amazing life. I had amazing childhood. My parents were incredible. I had everything that I wanted. Okay, so let's look into that deeper. So maybe there was a sibling who was really good at a sport and everybody went to the games and the parents thought they were creating this incredible environment of family and together. But the perception of the child was maybe I'm not good enough because I'm not out there on the field. You understand what I'm saying? So it doesn't have to be the big thing. It's the perception of the child in the moment. So events, relationship, lead us to false beliefs. Sometimes they can lead to amazing beliefs. It doesn't always have to be false, right? If you had a parent who told you you were fabulous and amazing and so lovable, then that's what you're going to carry with you. So events, relationships, beliefs, false beliefs usually is what I deal with. Emotions, because if you believe that you're worthless, you better believe you're going to have anger or sadness or hurt about that. And then that causes symptoms. Why does it cause symptoms? Because the subconscious mind's job is to move us away from pain towards pleasure. It's going to do what it can. If you discover that at 11 years old, if you ate French fries or a donut and it made you feel better, you're creating that pattern. And now you have eating you know, issues as you've grown older. Or you realize when you were 15 that all the pain would go away when you drank a beer then that could be something that you just use as your ability to release emotion. So people come to me for symptoms all the time. People say to me, what do you deal with? Majority, I deal with anxiety and addiction, but I deal with all kinds of things because it's just a symptom. I have no judgment about someone walks in with me. I know that behind all of it is emotions and beliefs and relationships or events younger than 10. 
And for somebody who who's suffering from some of these these kind of false beliefs, how do we start to discover them and how do we work to kind of transform them? So you don't necessarily need to see a hypnotherapist. I'm a hypnotherapist. That's my modem of the, but if you go to regular therapy, you better have someone who's going to help you drop into the subconscious mind or you're taking two or three years to get to one issue because the conscious mind's going to, you're going to spin around in it. And if you get to the subconscious mind, you're lucky. It takes a lot of repetition to do that. So find a way to drop into the subconscious mind. And I tell people, I can do this on the couch for a session. I tell people, where are you feeling that when you're talking about that you're angry with your boss or you feel like you're not respected in your life? Where do you feel that? In my chest. Okay, drop into that chest. What does it feel like? It feels like sadness. Okay, now, what does that remind you of? And they usually go back to the first time they did it very quickly. I encourage people to go find that inner child, take some deep breaths, relax your mind, go find that inner child who's feeling that hurt or that sadness or that fear and ask that child, what do you need? And I have a whole chapter on forgiveness. It's about really forgiving yourself or others and moving forward. If you don't have forgiveness, if you're in that moment, because every day that false beliefs, you're re-remembering that hurt or you're remembering that situation or that relationship and that regret every day. So it's about acknowledging it. So drop into the sensation and find your inner child and they're holding the belief and tell that inner child, what do you need from me? When people do this, it's so beautiful, Matt, because when you can connect to that child who's hurting, that's who's having the behavior. That's who's struggling. It's not the adult. The adult knows they want to do this. They want to have this career. They want to have this relationship. But when they're not finding it, when it's mismatched, it's because the inner child's waiting for you to come back. And when you connect to that inner child truly and say, no, the truth is you are lovable. You are not that situation. You are not what that person said. You are so much more. And the only person that can heal that inner child is the adult ego. And it's so, so important And I love doing that kind of work. I love people just untether themselves from it because when you can heal that little child, that inner child with love and acceptance and forgiveness, guess what goes away? All the symptoms. This is the basis of my work with addiction. When you're feeling worthless and your inner child is screaming at you and you feel unlovable, the only thing you have to do is opiates or alcohol. You're going to do it. When you heal the inner child, and they feel strong, and they feel lovable, and they know their strength, and it matches the adult, man, the addiction behavior goes because you know you're valuable. You're going to want to take great care of yourself. You know that you can create this life. So much wisdom in there. And I think it's it's fascinating that, you know, these experiences that we have before, you know, in many cases, even that we can't even remember consciously, have tremendous power in shaping who we are 10, 20, 30, you know, 40 years down the road. And if you don't really meaningfully investigate some of these issues, you know, these can be patterns that end up defining your life in a major way. They can. If you have a pattern or you feel stuck or you procrastinate or you sabotage and you don't know why, the answer is in your subconscious mind. Absolutely. For sure. And I know from my own experience, I was left from my childhood. I had an alcoholic mother and never felt safe. And She did the best that she could, and I have forgiveness in my heart for her. She's passed now, but I understood that it left me with unlovable, unwanted, and not valued, and I covered that up through external things. If your value is in a job or a car or whatever, a girlfriend or you know relationship, and it goes away, and you're so hurt and it doesn't match what just happened, you need to take a look at what buttons it's pushing. For me, I was devastated by the end of the relationship. And one day I was found myself in my closet and I was just hugging, crying and hugging myself. And I was like, oh my God, I used to do this when I was a child. I would go hide in the closet and just tell myself, you're okay, you're okay. I understood the connection and I understood my, anyone can get over an end of a relationship. It wasn't easy, but you can do it. What I was really hurting over was that the band-aid had been taken away from my false beliefs, unlovable you know, all those things. And when I healed that little girl and I understood that we didn't have to be in the closet anymore, that we could go out and be proud and know our value, 
everything changed around my relationship with my ex-husband. And I understood him. I saw him clearly. I saw my accountability in the end of the relationship. And I have to tell you now, I look back with wisdom. Thank God, because I wouldn't have this life. I wouldn't have this career. I wouldn't have the love in my life that I do if I had just stayed in that and pretended like everything was okay. And what do you think, and I know we've, we've talked about a lot of these kind of methodologies, but what do you think the core thing was or the few things were that allowed you to heal that inner child? Because as you said, it's, you know, once you kind of rip off the Band-Aid, they can be really scary emotionally. So I'm very curious, what do you think kind of helped you heal those issues? So when you're going through an emotional trauma, like a divorce, near death, death of someone close to you, you are open emotionally, subconsciously. So everything feels very raw to you. That's a good time to do traditional therapy, in my opinion. That's what I did. Then I started feeling better and started closing off. And then I switched therapist to someone who was better at getting me into the subconscious mind. And then I remembered the work that I had done in hypnotherapy. It took me a while to get there. Sometimes we don't have awareness when we feel overwhelmed. And I decided I was going to be a hypnotherapist. I wanted to help people. And I did my own work in hypnotherapy. And I stayed in the subconscious mind. The thing about doing hypnosis and hypnotherapy is you go right into the subconscious mind and it happens pretty quickly. My clients, three to five sessions, have a really good understanding and have some tools to be able to manage the rest of their life. So it can happen pretty quickly. Of course, I'm a hypnotherapist. I'm trying to tell people that hypnotherapy is incredible. It's not woo-woo. You have to get someone who's educated you know, in my school that they have over 500 hours of training. So if you're going to go to someone to do this kind of work, make sure they have the expertise, make sure that they can put you in hypnosis, but also when you're in there, do the work that you need. I'm curious about another topic that, that you've touched on in the past, which is the idea of these kind of I am stories. And I know that's Mm -hmm. tied into our filters and our false beliefs, but I'd love to hear a little bit about that. So the I am is your belief system about yourself and it is the false beliefs. And we can change our I am story, but we just have to be aware of it, right? We don't know what we're saying about ourselves. If consciously you're saying, I am fabulous, I am so capable, I am I am a winner, but your heart, you're getting that feeling in your chest, it's not congruent. And when you're not congruent, then it's impossible. A mind in conflict, Matt, will very seldom reach its goal or success. So be aware of the I am story. If you have a negative self-talker in your brain, then you need to get a hold of that because it's filtering. It's the I am. That's telling you the truth. And it's got the highest intention for you, but it's affecting you every day physically because it's sending all those chemicals. So one of the first things I do with the I am story first is teach people how to go into altered state. You can learn to do it on your own and then listen to what your truth is and argue for your truth but you must argue with that inner critic. There's a chapter called Cracking the Ego Code where I teach people about the inner critic, the inner child, and the adult ego. You just learn some simple skills and you start arguing with it. You don't allow it. You would never allow someone to speak to you the way we speak to ourselves inside our heads. Never, ever. We would be violent against them, but we allow it for ourselves. It doesn't make sense. I think that's a great point, which is that, and many times our self-talk is so harsh and critical And yet we would never speak to a friend that way. We'd never speak to a loved one that way. You know, we never would allow anyone else to talk to us that way. And yet that's, that's often how we speak to ourselves. It's, it's fascinating that, you know, that's something that most people are sort of almost unaware of that that's even taking place. And that inner critic has the highest intention for you. And usually it is a subpersonality of the ego state. Usually any behavior that we have is a subpersonality of the ego state. It usually has the highest intention. The subconscious mind does not want to harm you. It wants to help you. So I've had clients who were heroin addicts. The part of them that was the addiction was that they would rather see them dead than live through the pain. That highest intention was to help, but it doesn't work in their life, in their world. If you have a behavior or that negative self-talk, it's trying to remind you to be the best that you can be. It thinks that if it criticizes you, that you're going to make changes. It's not the truth. You're running an old program. I tell people, you're not going to run the same computer program for 20 years. Why would you do that in your mind? So when you go to that part of you, 
I love doing parts therapy. I do it all the time. I love it because when you understand that it is the highest intention of keeping you happy or finding success, but you change the behavior, you stop that internal battle, you hear a supportive voice every day, people's lives just just fly. They just untether themselves and they just soar. And I love that. I love hearing about the successes of my clients when they tell me, you know, when I started being nicer to me, then I stopped filtering through that I am this or I am that. I only heard I am capable. My best is good enough. And if there are areas in my life I want to improve, I'll do that with self-love and self-acceptance. Then they were able to focus easier because they're not in survival. They were able to accomplish their goals. They were meet incredible people in their life, stop addictive behavior. It's fantastic. I'd love to dig in a little bit, and we may have already kind of covered this, but to talk about kind of mental addictions and addictive behaviors. I know we touched on that earlier. I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on, you know, why those happen and how we can help overcome them. Certainly. So like I said, the subconscious mind, its job is to move you away from pain towards pleasure. So if you have this internal battle of feeling worthless or unlovable or not good enough all day long, whether you acknowledge it or not, it's showing up for you. You're re-remembering all of this through the day. And the subconscious mind will grab on to what it knows. So if it knows alcohol, if it knows porn, if it knows, you know, cigarettes, if it knows food, that's what it's going to do. It wants you to feel better. It doesn't think about the past or the future. It just in the now, it wants you to feel better now. That's why addictive urges just come on to people and they just like, you know what? I had that cigarette. I had that drink. I had, you know, I was smoking pot, like I was whatever before I even knew it. And that's how powerful the subconscious mind is. So when you move through the day and start acknowledging how you're feeling and you work with the inner child and you release those false beliefs of worthless and not valuable, it's very hard to stay clean and sober or to release a addictive behavior when you believe you're worthless or not good enough or not capable. So it's about getting to that and then learning your tools through the day pattern interrupting this stuff and have a plan. You have to have a plan. If you don't, you're going to move right into the behavior before you know it. So you learn your techniques, you spend your time. I tell people every morning, this is a great way to do this, is every morning before you open your eyes, you're already in a hypnotic state. Like I said, it's a change in a brainwave from alpha to theta to delta with delta sleep. So every day you go into an altered state to go to sleep and every morning when you come out of sleep, I set my alarm 10 minutes before I'm supposed to wake up or 20 and I spend that moment imagining my day and how I want it to go only positive. And I've already set myself up chemically and emotionally and in thought because I'm in an altered state already. It's a great opportunity to do that. So I have a plan. I don't have an addictive personality. Sugar is probably my thing. And I think that's, you know, about everybody in the, in the world, the country for sure. Sugar. So I have a plan of how I want to respond to decisions I want to make about sugar that day. And I give myself permission to create that. And it's so much easier for me to stay in that moment. But also feel the joy. When you do positive visualization, you can't just put the thought out there, I'm going to be a success. Because if you do that with fear, it runs away from you. And I know I'm going off topic because I could talk about this all day long. But give yourself the opportunity through the day would be the biggest technique that I would talk to people to allow emotion, acknowledge that felt sense and have a plan for anything that shows up for you. So what does it mean to you to practice happy? And I know that's a term you, you use in the book. And I'm curious to kind of, you know, give listeners a framework to think about going forward. What does that mean to you? Sure. So I'm a happiness hunter. And The idea of practice happy, when you know about the science of the mind and the body and neuroplasticity, you know that we train our brain how we fire it, we wire it that way. And some people who are just trying to survive, it's our natural instinct to survive. And sometimes we have to remember the negative. If negative things have happened to us, we never want to feel like that. So we're always scanning for it. And when you're scanning for it, you know people who are very negative about everything and they don't even see it. Because they're in survival mode all the time. And now they've got this negative, negative, negative. We learned this from, you know, ages where we had to remember what the cave bear looked like and smelt like and felt like. So it stays on the forefront of our thoughts. 
negative, negative, negative. Now we've trained our neurons to scan that way. Happiness is not going to come and sit in your lap. You must hunt for it. You must go find it. And the way to do that is if you awareness, conscious awareness is bring it to your forefront. If you see a negative thought, you flip it around. And if you continue to do that, even if it's just, you know what, I woke up this morning or okay, I didn't get fired, you know, whatever it is, I have $20 in the bank, you know, last week I only had five, whatever it is, find something positive because now you're retraining the neurons. When you do that, you practice the state of happy, you're retraining your neurons and all the research shows, beautiful research, neuroplasticity, proving what I do is that you can retrain it. You can literally change your mind in three to four weeks, but you must practice it. So that's why I have bands and shirts and, you know, it's part of my book chapter because we can take back our happiness. You have to know your version of happiness. You have to have awareness, but you can practice it. You can be a butt buster and you can be a happiness hunter all day long and it shifts your perception. And if you continue to do that, then eventually you're just going to be that way. We've talked about a bunch of different kind of strategies and interventions to help people or for people who are suffering. I'm curious, what's kind of one starting place or one sort of simple piece of homework that you would give to somebody listening to this interview that wants to kind of take a concrete step down this path? So I would say to them, people tell me I can't meditate, I can't go into hypnosis. Everyone can do it. Learn a technique, do headspace, go to my website, practicehappynow.com, download a meditation for sleep or to meet higher self, to hear that positive perspective again. Find a way to drop yourself into altered state and then start arguing for your truth and learn some techniques to allow, like I said, you know, the emotions or, or the felt sense in your body. If you start doing that and you gain awareness but you must do it in an altered state. You must do it in an alpha way. You can't outthink this. You must get in touch with your heart and then your mind will follow. So find something that works for you. Do the morning thing when you wake up. Just start with that. That's a good one. Do that. Also, if you're not sleeping, then sure download my sleep meditation. It just takes you in a natural state. If you're not sleeping, then you're automatically going to be in survival state, which is beta or high beta. Your body is the priority as a human. So if you're not sleeping, you just put yourself chemically into a survival state. We must sleep. You'll have so much more effective life. You'll have so much more success if you sleep. So very, very important. If you're not sleeping, then start with that for sure. And exercising a little bit will send those chemicals moving your body. You don't have to you know, do a big workout but you got to move your body and release those chemicals. So I think that would be a good start. And you don't have to go straight into inner child work. Just gain awareness. This is why I wrote the book, because it's an introduction to people to learn to manage a subconscious mind. Where can listeners, and and I think you, you just mentioned it, but where can listeners find you and find the book online? So of course I'm on Amazon. How big is your butt is on Amazon. I'm so proud. It's a international bestseller now six months going. So I'm super proud and happy because that means people are getting the message. It's great to say I'm an international bestseller, but people are getting the message and I'm getting the emails about how it's affecting them. Go to practicehappynow.com, download the meditations. If you're interested in the book, there's a couple chapters there for you. If you want to just start looking at it, that's fine. Also go to reneebrenthypnosis.com and podcasts like this and, and check me out. I'm all over the place. I love to speak to people. I speak all over the country. So just find me. If your listener has a specific question for me, please email me. Please email me and ask because I love helping people get started. If they have a specific question, I would love to hear from anybody. I really, that's why I do what I do, Matt. And you don't have to share it, but is there an email that you'd want them to send it to that you're willing to kind of put on the episode? Of course. No, my email's fine. Is Renee at practicehappynow.com or Renee Brent Hypnosis.com. Either one. Just send me a note. Text me. I love it. I'm open. Awesome. Well, Renee, thank you so much. This has been a, a fascinating conversation. And I've really enjoyed kind of hearing your story and learning this information. I think there's some very practical kind of mind body interventions to cultivate body awareness. And I'm very excited to implement many of these ideas. So thank you very much for being on the show. 
Oh, you're so welcome. And let me know how it goes. Thank you so much for listening to the science of success. Listeners like you are why we do this podcast. The emails and stories we receive from listeners around the globe bring us joy and fuel our mission to unleash human potential. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at scienceofsuccess.co. That's M-A-T-T at scienceofsuccess.co. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every listener email. The greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes, because that helps more and more people discover the science of success. I get a ton of listeners asking, Matt, how do you organize and remember all this information? Because of that, we've created an amazing free guide for all of our listeners. You can get it by texting the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222, or by going to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and joining our email list. If you want to get all this incredible information, links, transcripts, everything we've talked about, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes at scienceofsuccess.co. Just hit the show notes button at the top. Thanks again. And we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. 